Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos. And today I'm on the very eastern end of North Avenue, right where Bel Air Road starts its way northward. And behind me are the imposing gates of Baltimore Cemetery. That's what we're going to talk about today. Founded in 1850 and still going strong 174 years later. When the cemetery was founded, the Baltimore Sun noted that it was on 100 acres of rural land uh, that they called, quote, uh, susceptible of exqui exquisite excuse me, establishment. I think that means it was a good place for a cemetery. And if you're driving along North Avenue or Bel Air Road, you can easily miss the fact that this is on a wonderful hill overlooking downtown. It is a good place for a cemetery. When the cemetery got started, the Sun also noted that the first 2,000 lots uh, were going for $10 each and that that was a good deal. And in fact, it was. Nearby Greenmount Cemetery that had gotten started about 12 years before, uh, their lots were going for $100 each. So this was a good deal. Uh, but the founders uh, didn't just have a field with gravestones in it. They did some nice things. For one, uh, they built a plank road, big wooden planks over the mud to allow people to get out here, especially in the muddy spring weather, from Gay Street downtown. And they built a lovely chapel uh, inside. But for sure, the most imposing, the grandest part about the cemetery are the gates behind me. Um, and they hearken to Battle Abbey in England. If you're like me and you've had the date 1066 pounded into your head since grade school, uh, you may know that was the Battle of Hastings, where William the Conqueror comes over and defeats King Harold of England, ushering in the Norman era of British history. Um, apparently, William, before the battle, said to anybody who was listening, if I win this battle and become King of England, I will build an abbey on this spot. Um, and he did win the battle after being seated on the throne comfortably for a year or two. Apparently one person who was listening was the Pope and Pope Alexander II uh, sent him a little note that says, William, make do on your pledge. And he did. He built a Benedictine Abbey in a little place called Battle, just outside of the little town called Hastings. So it's kind of neat that here in Baltimore, we have a little bit of a reminder of one of the most critical turning points in English history here on North Avenue. All right, let's jump back to the cemetery um, and talk about a few of the folks who are buried here. And for that, I want to say a thanks to Jacques Kelly of the Baltimore Sun, who has written over the years a number of uh, wonderful articles exploring uh, folks uh, inside. Maybe the first notable person was a gentleman named John Vonderhorst. You may not know that name today, but if we're 100, 125 years ago, um, all Baltimoreans would have known that name. He was the owner of a brewery called Eagle Brewery, which at one point was the largest in the state. It was just north of here on Bel Air Road. Um, and uh, in addition to being uh, large, having the largest quantity, it was known for its quality. It was the only brewery in Baltimore uh, that grew its own malt. Uh, and Vonderhorst himself was, uh, in addition to a good businessman, was a little bit of a showman. Each year during Bach uh, beer season, and he was a German beer brewer like so many others, um, he would hitch up his team of horses to 18 or 20 beer wagons and parade them through downtown Baltimore, uh, himself sitting on the driver's seat of the very first one with his pet Angora goat beside him. Think of the famous Dalmatian for Anheuser-Busch and the Budweiser Clydesdales, uh, but in our own hometown version, it was a goat with a long beard. That was John Vonderhorst. Um, the second maybe uh, notable person here was a gentleman named Norman Cheney. Cheney played uh, the character Chubby in the movie series Our Gang, which, of course, got turned into the Little Rascals when it went uh, on television. Um, he was hugely popular in the 1920s and 1930s when he was uh, playing that character. He sadly died at the age of 21 and was buried here for almost 75 years in an unmarked grave in his family's plot um, until the early 2000s when a Detroit musician uh, going by the name Mikal C.G., and then an old movie lover out of California named Bob Satterfield uh, did an early, early crowdfunding campaign and raised $4,500 to uh, have a gravestone made for Cheney uh, here in the cemetery. 
Another notable person was Henry Leitner. Um, you may not know that name, but Leitner was the drummer boy in the War of 1812 as the British were uh, invading here in Baltimore. Um, he uh, tapped out not only tunes to sort of uh, lift morale for uh, the army in Baltimore, he, he tapped out messages sent from uh, the uh, sort of commanders down to the troops in the field, a critical role. He apparently played a drum that had been passed down in his family from the Revolutionary War. If you want to see that, it's at the Flag House uh, Museum uh, downtown. Um, and Leitner, uh, like many of the old defenders, each year would march in the uh, Defenders Day Parade. Uh, he playing the drum all the way up to age 84 when he uh, finally passed away in 1882, I believe. Another notable was Thoroughgood Smith, the second mayor of Baltimore. Um, his house on Front Street dating to the 1790s. We did a video on that with the Women's Civic League that is currently the steward there if you want to take a look at that. But most of the 115,000 or so souls who are buried here in the cemetery um, are not big names in American history. Um, they are middle class Baltimoreans uh, of all stripes. Many uh, Germans who worked for the folks like the Wanderhorsts in their breweries um, and some of Baltimore's uh, earliest Chinese residents, including a gentleman named Chin Sing, um, who the press noted at the time of his burial was a prominently uh, prominent laundry owner and member of a Masonic. Lodge. I'm going to wrap up by just saying a word or two about a number of young men who are buried here with names like James Tracy and, Henry, and Harry Forrest, uh, who were white Baltimoreans, and Frank Pierce, who was a black Baltimorean. Um, uh, in addition to being from Baltimore, one other thing they had in common is that they died in the Battle of Montfaucon. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, um, in France in uh, World War I. Um, it was one of the most deadly battles in uh, in the war and its deadliness and uh, its allied victory were a key factor in ending the war just uh, six months uh, six weeks later um, it was incidentally part of a campaign um, called the uh, Meuse Argonne campaign and if you know Argonne Drive in Northeast Baltimore um, that is a remembrance of that World War One campaign the, one of the uh, uh, chief uh, units that was fighting in this uh, battle was the 313th Infantry that was made up uh, largely of uh, young men from Baltimore, Western Maryland, and Pennsylvania. There were so many Baltimoreans, it was commonly called the Baltimore Infantry. Of the 26,000 people who died in this battle, uh, fully 1,700 were from Baltimore. I'm gonna wrap up and say the next time you're on North Avenue, uh, please stop by here and say hello to folks like John Vonderhorst and Norman Cheney and Henry Leitner, uh, but also uh, say hello and thanks to all the young men who gave their lives in World War I and are buried here uh, at the Battle of Montfaucon. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.